Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? This week's news covers a range of things. This goes from multiple infections with multiple strains of the CCP virus at the same time, people trying to treat themselves inappropriately, and discovery of extraterrestrial organisms, or at least DNA that could one day form an organism. Let's begin with the simplest, or at least the first of these, and as always it relates to the CCP virus. The CCP virus, like most coronaviruses, is mutating, and relatively quickly. Quicker than the influenza virus that we are most familiar with, but still, quickly. This newest variant is called B1525. This is coming out of England. It's a concern as the prior UK variant of the virus, the one we're more familiar with, is more infectious. And being more infectious, well, that's a big concern. We already have trouble handling the original CCP virus strain. The conversation goes into a great deal of detail, not only on the UK variant, but explains some of the other occurrences and why they are a problem, how they're identifying them, where they're showing up, and more. The link to that entire article can be found in the description below. Next is a case study. And the case study looks at what will happen when you are infected simultaneously with two different strains of the CCP virus. But ironically enough, it doesn't appear to have affected the severity of the illness. And they both were able to recover without hospitalization. But that's not quite what was expected. Taking the case zero, for example. In order to get the very first human case of the virus, the virus had to come from the original animal, most likely a bat or a pangolian. Then it had to get into another animal, such as a pig. From here, it can mutate and then enter a human host. Theoretically, it is possible for two viruses to enter the same host at the same time, cross over, so to speak, and create a third new virus. This third new virus could either have some of the best parts or the worst parts of the two separate viruses or a mix of everything in between. This is one way that viruses evolve or develop new mutations that can either be beneficial or detrimental to their ongoing survival. While having two infections at the same time is the most likely explanation, there is another possibility and we alluded to this in the first news item for this week. That is, the virus could be mutating within the host, creating a spin-off of a new strain while the original is still there. This would explain the identification of two distinct virus strains in one host. This will occur when one cell is infected by both viruses, or one virus that is slightly different to the other and has already mutated. The two engage in recombination, in which they change over genetic material. If this change creates a usable mutation, then the cell will continue to replicate that DNA strand. If it doesn't, it gets corrected by the cell's machinery. This phenomena could be one reason why we are seeing the CCP virus mutate so quickly and so effectively. The human cell machinery is in fact promoting its development and the nature of an RNA virus is further compounding this effect. This leads to regular and more effective mutations that the human cell then to some degree corrects, or at least avoids the growth and increased number of. If only those viruses that have a successful or beneficial mutation can be replicated in the human cell, then only those that are beneficial to the virus will continue to be promoted and then infect more people. In response to this and the other growing news around the CCP virus, particularly the increasing number of infections until very recently, the FDA in America has approved the Johnson & Johnson vaccine as we had anticipated. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is somewhat more advantageous in some ways and less in others. Of particular note is that it's more easily stored and transported and only requires one dose to be administered. The downside to it is that it is substantially less effective than the others. 
but not so much that it is as much of a concern as it might otherwise be. Having yet another vaccine available, even if it's not as effective as the others, means that America can keep moving forward with its vaccination regime. As it stands now, approximately 1 in 7 Americans have been vaccinated. This might also help to some degree with people desperately trying to gain access to the vaccine. While there are some who are very resistant to the idea, others are desperate and will do anything to be vaccinated. Some are even falling for scams. Those who aren't may be poisoning themselves. Yes. For some reason, there are still people who believe that a anti-parasite medication, specifically a worming medication for horses called ivermectin, can be used to treat them for the CCP virus. Parasitic worm? Virus. There's a disconnect in the treatment there. It's like taking antibiotics for a virus. It just doesn't work. It has been reported that there has been a not insignificant increase to the number of calls to the poison center hotline about ivermectin. The first issue with this whole idea is that there is no evidence around its use to treat, cure, or in any way prevent the CCP virus. In fact, nearly all of the interest has been generated by one small group who have previously thought vitamin C would help with sepsis. That also won't happen. The second and perhaps more significant issue was that Assuming that even if there was some kind of relationship, the dose in ivermectin intended for horses is substantially larger than any dose intended for a human. Horses are much larger. Much larger muscle mass, much larger liver, many things that mean you can give them a lot more drug for their size and it will still work the way it's intended to without harming them. You give that same dose to a human, and you're in for a world of pain. This is like people trying to poison themselves with hydroxychloroquine yet again, where there is a lack of evidence, or in the case of hydroxychloroquine, there was at least some evidence, but certainly a lot of inconsistent evidence. This time, we don't even have that incredibly low threshold for proof. And people are looking at using this medication that is generally safe for animals themselves. At a low dose, it is possible to be tolerated by a human. It will create some un anticipated and unpleasant side effects, nausea, rashes, and an increased heart rate. You increase this dose and suddenly you have a lot more problems. The more immediate and obvious ones being seizure, coma, breathing problems, and heart problems. These tend to end badly, and as such, People are calling me Poison's hotline. Going from people doing dumb things to people doing kind of cool things and then failing. SpaceX has been able to successfully launch and then re-land its SN-10 Starship. And then it caught fire. Yeah. SpaceX has a habit of burning their spaceships. Not entirely sure why they want to do that, as we imagine they're quite expensive and difficult to make. The rocket got 10 kilometers high and then turned around and performed its descent procedure. This means the prototype effectively did its job. Well, until it didn't. The ultimate failure was preceded by two others, where this at least launched and landed successfully, but the others did not do so. Now for something that will make the creationists worry. Asteroids have been found with what could be described as very primitive organic matter. The matter was brought back to Earth by the Hyalopolis probe. The probe was sent out in 2010. It successfully landed on the asteroid Itokawa and brought back samples. It's well known that asteroids like Itokawa are some of Earth's primary sources for these things. They're known to contain most of the essential ingredients for life. This means that they have often been considered at least a strong contender for what might have brought life to Earth. 
What separates Itokawa from other asteroids, such as the Ryugu that Hayabusa has recently visited, is that Itokawa is a siliceous asteroid. This is distinct from the carbon-rich asteroids like Ryugu. These, at least in theory, would have had more difficulty supporting life, or anything that precedes life. In this case, the same chemical reactions are being seen anyway, that is, chemical reactions that mix the necessary chemistry in order to give the precursors to life, early things that could build up and then turn into something more complex, such as early nucleic acids. Hopefully once the Japanese Space Agency can start looking at what the Hayabusa 2 probe brought back, we'll be able to examine both the original Hayabusa 1 samples, those coming from Itokawa, and those coming from Ryugu. The combination of three different asteroids, each with different compositions, locations, and circumstances, would be a strong argument that the chemistry that occurs in space on these asteroids, or has come into contact with these asteroids after they've begun cooling down, is enough to begin the process of creating life. This would, at least somewhat, knock us off our pedestal of being the sole, unique, sentient species looking into space. Looking closer to Earth, the final news item for this week regards chatbots. Most people are familiar with them, having had interactions at some point or another, whether that's dealing with a business, search engine, and so on. As recently as 2016, Microsoft attempted to create one that was more interactive and could learn from people. Tay did not end well. Going back to yet another attempt now, Microsoft is trying to find a way that could create a chatbot that would, in effect, recreate someone's personality. Someone's personality that has died. Ghost in the Machine or Lovelace's Demon, whichever one you wish to think of, wasn't meant to refer to using an AI to recreate the dead. The conversation started looking at this and how they're developing their chatbot using a lot of your personal data. Things that you leave throughout the internet, like breadcrumbs. The trail of who you are, what you do, and how you do it. Particularly communication, but also plenty of other things, such as your interests. There's currently not a lot of legal rules about exactly how this information is handled, and more so once you're dead. As a general rule, your ability to control your data, or for that matter anyone else to do so, when you pass away is almost nil. The Conversations article provides more detail on exactly what laws apply where and how in different countries, and how this might have an effect in the long term. Certain models could be used to try and curtail the issue and get ahead of any problems that could start up. On the other hand, they also explain how this could be useful as a tool for developing systems that would allow you to interact with generations in the far future based on your own behaviours, interests, and more. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions that you have below.